Welcome back to the Mountain Bike Build Series. I'm freaking stoked. Uh, I hope you are because this is the point in the build where we're going to set the frame fixture to the five variables from BikeCAD and then we can start cutting tubes, drilling holes, mitering, fitting them in there, uh, prepping them for welding because this tube doesn't really have any use or meaning to me right now. It's just a tube. But when it becomes a frame, I can shred it. I can ride it and it's going to be sick. Uh, let's get into it. So I want to get started by setting up this frame fixture uh, for the geometry of the bike we're making. Now, I did uh, two YouTube videos about this frame fixture. This is something I made, uh, but I can set it up with outputs from BikeCAD. So there's five, uh, well, six now, uh, linear dimensions and then one angular dimension here. And so what's cool is that uh, BikeCAD gives me the numbers I need, spits them out, and I can just set this up according to the linear scales, angular scales. And then it also tells me how long to cut the tube where to put the miters and the angles and stuff and it's a check right so I can cut the down tube and I can set it in here and uh, if it if it matches up that's awesome really uh, proves to me that uh, I, I didn't screw something obvious up and uh, so yeah we need to get started by setting up the numbers of this thing so we're in BikeCAD here, and uh, thank you, Brent. Uh, BikeCAD just makes my life so much easier. You know, I can model uh, a bike in Fusion in some ways that are more powerful, but then each new dimension that I want to pull, it's a whole production, and BikeCAD has all these dimensions built in. So I want to set up the frame fixture, and I've pulled up on screen uh, these dimensions here, which are what I need, and there's one more. So uh, if I go into the dimensions dialog box here for jig setup, these are the four that I use uh, there's head to bottom, head you know head to bottom X and Y, and then JFX and JFY. I don't know what those are from, but uh, this is based on my kind of screwy frame fixture, which I talked about in some of those other videos. But basically, you just need to find which of these outputs match with the fixture that you have, or even uh, when I used to not even have a fixture, and I would build them on that heavy table there with some weird stuff. And uh, there were outputs actually that really made setting up that easier. Uh, just simple geometric relationships that he's he's made dimensions for. So anyhow, uh, I put those on screen. And so uh, what it is is that uh, this the the central axis of the head tube should always be perpendicular to the main beam of my frame fixture. That's the way I designed it. And so all these dimensions are just either parallel or perpendicular to the to the center axis of this head tube here. And so I have from and then this is the origin actually the the center of the bottom bracket shell is x y zero zero. And so as we go up this way, that's our, uh, our x-axis, and then our y-axis is like sort of vertical to that. Uh, so anyhow, uh, I want to set the bottom center of the head tube, and I also want to set the center of the dummy axle on the rear end. And so that's what I need these four dimensions for. Uh, and then also, I'll get to this one in a minute, and then there's a, there's a sixth one. So let's set up these ones. I want the x for the bottom of the head tube to be 746 and I want the Y to be 240. Well, right away we have problems, which is not necessarily a problem. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. So uh, this is a long, long and slack front end mountain bike. I specifically made it very long. And when I designed this frame fixture like three years ago, I was thinking, you know, I mostly made like road-ish bikes, like touring and gravel and whatever you want to call it, different kinds of things. And uh, so I designed based on what I knew and what I was familiar with. And uh, yeah, this really does not reach forward, uh, forward far enough. So uh, where this indicator is reading right now for the, uh, the X adjustment, I'm at like, you know, 592. And if I wanted to get to, what was it, 746? If I want to get to 746, this pointer needs to be lined up all the way at the very end, which means, if we zoom out a little bit here, it means that this whole sliding assembly needs to be out in space like here. And uh, of course, that wouldn't be supported by anything. And so, uh, you know, it's great. This was something that I, I made for myself, uh, for my needs at the time, so I could learn from it. And I did, and now I'm learning even more, which is even more value, right? Like, I'm glad that I can learn this on, on this. But what it means is that uh, the the scale here along the top, so I have actually two pieces of this tape, and the one is for the, it reads higher as you, you know, from left to right it reads up, and that's uh, the, the x-axis for the lower head tube, and then this one uh, left to right um, reads down, uh, and this is for the rear end. So what I need to do is I need to uh, loosen these four screws and slide this back considerably, and then this rule will be uncalibrated, which is annoying. 
and then I will be able to remeasure and set up the front end. And then this extrusion, this main beam is just not long enough to do both at once. So what I'll have to do is completely fabricate the front end of the bike. And then after I've done that, I'll have to slide everything forward again uh, to about where it is. And then I will have to find a way to reference that angle. Well, that'll actually be easy. But uh, anyway, I'll have to slide it forward again and then build the rear end. It's almost like how some people build tandem bikes yeah, it has a little bit in common with that, but anyhow, uh, it's a it's it's something that I can learn from, and I have the time to deal with it. And hopefully, y'all can learn a little bit from this if you're designing your own fixture or if you're looking at frame fixtures out there. Uh, the new mountain bike designs, I think, are really stretching the limits of even what the Anvil and Sputnik and a lot of other uh, frame fixtures can do because it's just longer and uh, bigger front ends than than whatever used to be made. Uh, and you can see that too if you order tubing like this tube here. This is offered now from Nova Cycle Supply, and uh, this is a long frickin' tube. This is the down tube of the bike, but uh, they used to not sell a budded chromoly tube this long. You would have had to made it out of you would have had to have made it out of uh, straight gauge tubing, and so I think that just speaks to the fact that uh, as as design changes and the bikes change, so does the needs of the the tools and stuff. All right, moving forward, I uh, I got this moved into a zone where now I can use it. So it's 130 millimeters back. So that means that I need to set this to 616 millimeters. Got to loosen all four of these freaking handles. That's another thing. I don't, yeah, I'm not sure if I love that about this frame fixture. There's just too many handles. So that pointer, there we go. And 240 on the Y. Uh, and then here we have uh, two more things, right? So we have this here is not even the seat tube angle. This angular scale references, it's the seat tube angle minus the head tube angle because as you'll notice, there is no head tube angle adjustment. And so uh, it's baked in there. Like the, the main body of the fixture is always 90 degrees to the head tube. And so you just have the one angular adjustment. So if you had a 73 degree head tube angle and seat tube angle on an old school road bike, you would set this to zero. And here we're at 5.6, so I already set it, but there's just two handles. And uh, it was actually, it was already set to the right degree, uh, like as close as I could get it, it was kind of weird. But, and then there's this, uh, and this is when you have the, uh, the curved C-tube, it's offset forward. And so you could, you could just change the angle of this to fudge it so that this cone that holds the top of your C-tube uh, holds it where it needs to. But here you can slide that forward and now the tube comes square onto the cone and uh, it just works better. When I made this, I didn't know how to, I had just gotten my CNC mill when I made this part of it and I didn't know how to engrave like a millimeter scale or something on here, so I didn't. And I just measured this with calipers, uh, which is in ideal, you know, everything should really have a, a label on it for uh, how to set it up. So now we have, this is set at its coordinate position and this angle is set and this is set uh, to its forward position. I set this, uh, according to bike CAD, 36 millimeters forward, which I think I covered in the bike design videos. And then uh, for the seat tube angle, when you're designing, you might like to know your, uh, your effective seat tube angle, which is the point from the center of your bottom bracket to the center of your saddle. And uh, here, we're not interested in that. We want to know the actual seat tube angle when we're figuring this out. So the actual seat tube angle was um, 70.6 and then you subtract 65 was the head tube angle, I think. And that's what I got uh, 5.6 here. So now the front end of this is set up and we can start loading tubes into it. All right. I want to start by loading this guy, the head tube, into the frame fixture. And uh, where the tubes join, uh, I want to I want to have a hole drilled in the head tube at the top and the bottom at those joint locations, uh, partly so that when I'm welding, uh, the gases can expand and flow through there. If I was back purging argon into the frame, I would want want it to be able to flow through to the inside. Uh, also, because it's steel, you have the possibility of through the condensation and stuff, or through a water bottle boss hole, you can get. Uh, moisture into the frames and it can rust from the inside out and I think it's a better system rather than sealing that off uh, to have big openings for the air to be able to flow through and stuff and you can apply frame saver to the inside of the frame. So I'm going to drill some holes in here before I load it in the frame fixture and I'm going to use bike CAD to d derive where I need to put those holes.
So I'm just gonna do a real simple point-to-point -point measurement in bike CAD. Start linear dimension, and I bring it up to the center, that's like 32 millimeters, and then I bring it up to here, that's uh, 108 millimeters. So 32 and 108. And now I grab my ruler. 32, and this really is not a high precision uh, affair. Does that look right? Yeah. Now I can drill these on the bridge port. So I'm gonna hold it in the middle of the vise just like this, and um, I have a 5 8 diameter hole saw. You could use a drill bit, but I think this works really well actually. All right, so this is really not a high precision thing. What matters is uh, putting these marks in the right spot so that you're like, you know, within a couple millimeters of your mark. Uh, but, but whether or not it's on center this way is not critical because the rotation of the tube and these are hidden from sight and uh, the, them being in the right spot in this direction really doesn't matter other than structurally, if you got it too close to the weld, it would be harder to weld or it could, you know, become weaker or something. So, um, I just want to get it lined up, looks like visually on the apex of the tube here, and then after I after I pop the one hole in there, I'm gonna I'm gonna crank the table in the Y axis only, and uh, that should make it pretty easy for me. I've got the slug from the first one is stuck in the cutter here. So I don't really like drilling these particularly. If I was gonna drill these, I would use a stub length drill, like a half inch diameter stub length drill. Uh, a long one, a long normal drill, as you go to drill, it's gonna wanna wander off to one side or the other. And so a stub length would do better with that. This works great, except for when, uh, like just happened, the slug gets packed in there and sometimes it's kind of a pain in the butt to get out of there. Um, so I had to chisel at it and I, uh, but, but anyway, this works pretty well. It makes a pretty nice hole. This, if you use a drill, it has a tendency on tubing or thin, anything that's thin, a normal twist drill has a tendency to make like a three-sided or three-lobed hole, which is kind of weird. And I like making round holes when I can. Yeah, so I got the slug packed in there again. I don't know, maybe that's not worth it. Maybe that's not worth making a nice round hole, but <laughs> it's done now. And so you can see, I mean, those just look nice. doesn't matter if you drill a little bit off to one side or the other. Uh, you're not going to see it, uh, so maybe I shouldn't care about making them round. Uh, but what I do want to do is when I set this in the fixture, I want this, the center line of those two holes, to be, you know, in plane with the frame, basically. So I'm going to deburr these. So you can see the burrs on the inside are worse than the burrs on the outside were. Uh, does it matter to deburr them? Maybe it doesn't. I feel like, you know, when you're making a nice thing, uh, you don't want burrs on it. You know, if you were reaching in there or something, you'd like it to be smooth and nice. So uh, this is one kind of deburring tool. They call this like a whirly gig or I don't know, this uh, different names for this. And then this one here is like a triangular scraper. And so this one is a little bit dull, but you can resharpen these pretty easily with a bench grinder. And then I wrap tape around it because I like to choke up on it and hold it real close. But anyhow, uh, these are really valuable to have uh, for different deburring operations. So this one you can kind of get on the back side. I bias the one for the down tube sits up higher and the one for the top tube is closer to the end. It sits on like this. There we go. And now I just want to line it up so that, uh, you know, I want to phase it basically so that these are in line with the frame. Uh, it's not, it's not dire that it be absolutely perfect, but I just want it to look uh, more or less straight. And if it was real cocked, then you'd be closer to the weld and that could be a structural issue or yeah. 
So the next thing I want to do is I want to make that primary miter on the seat tube where it meets the bottom bracket. So on the frame fixture, the seat tube comes down, curves back, and then it smacks into the bottom bracket. And if we cut it square, it's not going to fit worth a damn. We, we need it to have this half round shape on it, right? That's mit mitering. And so on bike CAD, we have uh, the model of that. And so yeah, right here, this little half round shape, this secondary miter thing, that's gonna be on the, on the down tube and we'll do that later. But right now we're just gonna make the seat tube fit up against the bottom bracket shell. And so I thought a lot about how I wanna do this since we shot the, the last segment. Um, but I think, I think I have it figured out. And so um, basically we know that the center line of the seat tube is 36 millimeters forward of the center of the bottom bracket shell measured on, on this angle here. Uh, measured, uh, what is that, perpendicular to the, to the center line of the seat tube. And then we also know that it's 433 millimeters from the top of the seat tube to the top face of the bottom bracket shell. And I think these are the numbers I'm mainly gonna use um, or the convenient ones from Bike CAD. Uh, what I want is, is I want it, uh, it, it's tricky because where do you measure from? Uh, and so I think I'm going to measure from the top of the seat tube. And then here, um, I know that it's 36 millimeters back, but I, I think what I'm actually going to be looking at is what's more important to me is that this, this rear edge of the tube, I want that to come basically tangent to the outside of this circle here. And so, um, I can do that by eyeballing it on the machine. And uh, what I'm learning through doing this is that uh, this particular miter is weird and complicated to do with the tools that I have. And really most bike frame building specific tools I don't think would handle this one great. And so uh, I'll be thinking about that before I do another mountain bike if I should build a specific tool. But let me show you what I have set up on the machine. So I'm gonna show this, this tool more in the future, but this is something uh, that's based loosely on a tool that uh, Drew from Engine Cycles has, and it's used for seat tube slotting. The last step of uh, after you've reamed and honed the seat tube, you put that little slot for the pinch bolts that clamp the seat post. And so I can put the whole frame, and what it is is this tool goes in my milling machine vise, and it's got a flat plate, and then with these toggle clamps here, I can clamp down the frame and I can do a slotting operation. Well here, I'm using the same thing. I have the tube loaded on top here and, uh, and it's about ready to cut. And so let me take it out of the machine. See how this works? There's, this is a brace, this is the piece that gets clamped and then it just supports this flat plate basically uh, in the XY coordinate plane on the machine. And so, these toggle clamps hold it down. What I did is I put gaff tape. It's uh, like people who work in uh, theater and stuff will use this all the time. It's really good tape. It's really good all-purpose tape, but it's grippy and it's just a little bit squishy. And so, uh, I think that's going to hold the tube from slipping around on there. And now by clamping it from above, it registers, uh, there, there's a flat plane established by the bend. Uh, if the bend was cocked up a little bit, it wouldn't sit flat. And so by pinching it down with these two points here, uh, I'm pretty confident that it's laying flat in this plane. And now uh, these, these here are two blocks with the half round shape so that there's not really a pinch point. This one even uh, is a little bit rounded on the edges. And so it's held down firmly. And then I put some scribbles on here, but uh, basically I know where I want my miter to start. Uh, 433 millimeters, I think I said, was to this mark. And so I measured that and I marked that there with that blue Sharpie line. And then when I put it in there, this is my rough cut line. So I'm going to hacksaw on this line just to get rid of, uh, when I'm mitering, I don't want a whole bunch of extra material on there that I don't need. So I'm going to cut it right here, put it back in the machine, and then uh, line up uh, the edge of the cutter to this line and then line up the, the rear edge of the cutter so that it's almost tangent to the back edge of this tube. These are my three hacksaws here. And I have an 18 tooth, 24 tooth, 32 tooth. Really useful to have, plenty fast for a lot of uh, tubing cuts to be able to just make a quick cut. And I, I hold the tube in my bench vise through some means like this, and then I make a cut. And uh, these are plenty fast if you have a good one and the blade is sharp. Well, I'm always like, lately I've had a really bad habit about just making a cut with a dull blade and like powering through it even though it sucks. And I don't want to model, model bad behaviors on camera, so I'm actually going to switch on a new blade, which I've been putting off for months. All three of these are dull, actually. Uh, really bad on my behalf. But it's, it, I just kind of hate changing the blades. It's not really that hard. 
Uh, so when I get that done, then I can make the cut. I don't really understand when people complain about using a hacksaw. A nice hacksaw is a joy to use so long as you're not trying to hack through anything with a heavy cross section. But changing blades, I got sympathy for that. I don't like doing that. Very easy when you have actually a nice saw frame and a sharp blade. This is such a weird setup. I did, I did some videos about why the Bridgeport Mill is so good, and one of the things that really makes it great is how versatile it is. That's like one of the key things. And I could not get this cutter where I needed it in space without extending the ram. And so there's dovetails here, and this whole thing can slide forward if you want it to. You loosen this, this bolt and another one back there, and then this is a handle, and you can use its uh, rack and pinion, and you can crank the whole thing toward you and lock it down again. And Ah, it's a pain in the butt, but I did it. So we're about ready to make the cut. I have my Sharpie line here. Now, I mean, the width of your Sharpie line uh, is, a, is a relevant consideration. The, where the top of the tube is, is not dire. So, like, you always want to be thinking when you're building stuff about what your tolerance is. Things that need to have, uh, you know, kind of a critical fit, you got to take your time and make sure it comes out right. And uh, it costs more money and it's more hassle and whatever. Uh, to do things to a tighter dimension. But you know, if you need to, you need to. In this case, it's not super critical, so I'm not gonna waste too much time on it. But it's not because I'm careless or I don't care about the finished product. It's about, you know, that we're always short of uh, time and uh, resources in life and you gotta pick and choose uh, about what, what you wanna spend them on. And so what, where that would matter for the length of the cut, I mean, I wanna get it within like two or three millimeters or something, but where it really matters is that because there's this damn curve in here, that throws everything off, makes everything more complicated. And by uh, the location of this cut is actually relevant, uh, as you'll see later, when it comes to fitting the down tube. Um, if you could get it exactly to the computer model, like precisely, precisely, it would make cutting the down tube just a little bit easier. But I'm not gonna split hairs too much or worry too much about it, because uh, this is just what it is. So I have a Sharpie mark to line up with in this sort of direction that I'm just eyeballing uh, to the cutter. So I marked that right there. And then now here I'm using a square and this is just the square that I have that's the right length. And what I want is I want this cutter, which doesn't spin totally concentric, it changes a little bit as you spin it. I want this cutter to be just a little bit over the edge of the tube. Something like that, or maybe a little bit further. See how I'm doing that? I'm sighting it so that uh, it, it, if they were lined up with each other, that back edge of the tube would be tangent uh, to the bottom bracket shell. And I want it to be almost tangent, but I don't want it to extend past. Uh, so I would prefer the cutter to be a little bit to this side of the tube. And, um, and we have it. So I'm gonna lock it down and I'm gonna make a cut. That turns on the gearbox for the power down feed. That's a little bit fast. So this is the way this works. These are these are called toggle clamps, and they uh, they cam over center, so they're swinging, and then and then they get tight, and then you push them a little harder, and they kind of cam over. And I use these two blocks with shims. This is all just in the name of me making it work today to get it done. And if I was building many of these bikes, I would not be using this. This is pretty hokey, right? I was worried that the the cutter was going to grab and throw the workpiece and. I would like a better solution, but you know, I don't do this day in and day out. This is the first time I've done this. 
So I'm just going to make do with, with this, try and learn some from the process, gather ideas, and then next time I make a mountain bike, maybe I'll build a better tool for this before I get to this step. Or, you know, as someone who makes tools for bike frame builders, uh, maybe I'll see that it would be well received uh, to make a, a tool that solves this problem for everybody and put it up for sale. So we'll see. But for now, this did get the job done. Uh, I think this is going to clean up pretty nicely. So I want to deburr this and then I want to test fit it on the fixture. I really like using that triangular scraper on the inside and on the outside I like using this one inch uh, belt sander. That's a good preliminary deburr. Before I weld it, I would clean it up a little bit more. But now it's deburred enough that I can set it on here. I'm gonna check the fit. So if you look at this, it's, it's a really nice fit. I don't see any more of a gap on one side than the other side. It's offset back uh, toward the rear of the frame like I wanted. Uh, yeah, it looks nice. One thing I want to do real quick is uh, when, when you have the C-tube in here and it's sitting down, you don't want it to be uh, off of the center line of the frame. And there's a lot of ways that you can do that. And uh, one quick thing that I'm going to do right now is I'm going to use my digital calipers to scribe lines on the shell. So this is an inch and three eighths diameter or 34.9 millimeter tube. And then the down tube is a uh, larger diameter. And so anyway, I'm just going to scribe lines on here uh, so that I so that I have a line so I, I know how to center this up. So that's at the width for the C tube, and then ahead of that I'm gonna do one at the width for the down tube. Cool. So now that I have these lines scribed on here, I just have sort of like a, a mark for where to center the tube to, which actually is not even the best way to do this. It's a quick and dirty way, but uh, before I weld this, I'm gonna wanna sand off this mill scale anyhow and you wouldn't see it anymore. Uh, but while I'm doing all the test fitting with the mitering, that's a, it's a way to help me get started so that I, so I know when the tubes are centered. So before I set the seat tube aside, I do want to drill the hole for the vent. So where the top tube and the seat tube bang into each other, I want there to be a vent hole there. I'm going to do it with this small center drill. I don't know if that's a quarter inch or what that is. It doesn't really matter. It's just to allow the gases to pass through during welding and stuff. Um, so the way that I'm getting that phased is I'm putting this flat, flat uh, block against uh, against here and I'm just trying to feel it so that it feels like it's sitting on there nice and I'm using a square to, to check and yeah it's pretty close to being square it doesn't matter too much that's just my sort of quick setup and now So I decided before I set the C-tube aside, I'm also gonna drill the holes for the water bottle bosses. So these guys here that you screw your water bottle cage into. And um, so that's a quarter inch hole, 65 millimeters apart on center. And I use bike CAD to lay out, it, it models you know, what the bottles look like in space. So you know you're putting them in a sensible location. And uh, for this one, I, again, I phased the tube the same way, and I actually used an edge finder to get on the center line of the tube. I'll show that step later when I'm mitering uh, some of the other tubes. But uh, I have a, this is a quarter inch spotting drill. This works pretty well. Uh, or a center drill also works pretty well. And uh, I'm gonna make the cut. I have my digital readout set up, so it's in millimeters right now. And uh, zero is right here, and then I'll move over 65 millimeters and I'll take another cut. Uh. 
Now while I'm centered up, I'm gonna test fit these and just make sure I have a good fit. It's pretty easy to open this up a little bit more while I'm here. That's nice, that's kind of what you want for like silver brazing. Uh, you don't want it to be super tight or it wouldn't pass silver and you don't want it to be really loose either. So I think it's a pretty good fit. Now some of these are from different suppliers. Uh, maybe, maybe these are all Paragon actually, I'm not sure. Let me try this one, looks a little bit different. Just curious. See this one doesn't really go. You wouldn't want to fit like that. Uh, you could use a bigger drill, but I'll just use some of these smaller ones. Uh, because they, they fit, but they're not all made to exactly the same fit. It's usually roughly a quarter inch, but you, you always want to check that sort of thing. Uh, you'd hate to get it all fluxed up and then go to assemble it and they, and they don't all fit, so. Now here, I'm on just a slight angle, uh, which is not something you want, but it's pretty slight, and so I'm just gonna take it easy. The drill has a tendency to want to walk downhill, uh, but uh, I think it'll be easy as long as I go slow. And as, as far as the water bottle mounts are concerned, I don't think that's such an angle that it would present an issue for a water bottle cage bolting up nicely to those. Pretty nice fit there. I don't want these videos to get too long, so we're splitting this up into at least two videos. Uh, we're we're going to carry on with the down tube and the top tube. If that video exists on YouTube as you're watching this, it'll be on screen right here and you can click it. And if not, it'll be up in a couple of days because we're cruising through this. Uh, I'm fucking stoked. This is totally awesome to see my beautiful bike coming together. <laughs>